Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Philosophy. This is Professor Paul Hicks. Uh, today we're going to talk about the philosopher Rene Descartes. Uh, but before we get into Descartes, I need to talk to you a little bit about, uh, I guess, two warring camps that we happen to have in philosophy, two different uh, ways of approaching a topic. In particular, where do our ideas come from? How do we get knowledge? What does it mean to know what we know? All right, excuse me, there's a little cat that happened to walk through here. What does it mean to say, I know what I know? How do I come to know any sort of given propositions? How can I come to know anything whatsoever? Do I rely on, say, my sense data, my sensory experiences that I get from some outside world impressing them upon me? Or am I actually born with some sort of innate knowledge, some sort of ideas that uh, uh, interpret any other new ideas that come to me, but the true understanding comes from reason itself. So the history of philosophy has had the warring camps of what we call empiricism versus rationalism. The empiricists have always claimed that sense experience itself is the ultimate starting point for all of our knowledge. They claim that the senses maintain and give us all of our raw data about the world, and without this raw material, there would be no knowledge at all. We couldn't come to know anything. That it's through perception which starts a process, and from this process came all of our beliefs. In its purest form, what empiricism holds is that sense experience alone gives birth to all of our beliefs and all of our knowledge. Compare that now to the rationalist, where the rationalists have claimed um, that the ultimate starting point for all knowledge is not our senses, but rather reason itself. And what they maintain is that without any sort of prior categories and principles supplied by reason, we couldn't organize and interpret our sense experience in any sort of way. Rationalism in its purest form goes so far as to hold that all our rational beliefs and the entirety of human knowledge consists in first principles and what they call innate concepts. These are concepts that you're simply born with. Um, and that these concepts are somehow generated and certified by reason along with anything logically deducible from these first principles. So uh, which one is actually right? Which one is true? Rationalism or empiricism? So we're going to go ahead and we're going to start with the philosopher by the name of Rene Descartes and we'll determine whether or not he's a rationalist or an empiricist. So let's think about Descartes for just a bit. His dates are 1596 to 1650. Um, we're going to go through his first couple meditations here, in particular the first three meditations. Um, and he's going to talk about a little bit about what knowledge is and try to understand how it is we can come to know anything. And he's also going to give an argument for the existence of God. All right, so let's go ahead and start with his first meditations if we can. So Descartes starts off uh, recognizing that there's a lot of stuff that he knows to be true today, but at one point in time believed was false. And there's a lot of stuff that he holds to be false today, but at one point in time he thought were true. And so it stands to reason that, say, five years down the road from now, there's going to be something I hold to be true, but I actually hold to be false today. In other words, I hold false beliefs. We all hold false beliefs. All right? I, I, it would be uh, irrational for me to think that Everything I believe happens to be true. And of course, I believe it to be true, but does it have to be true? Am I, do I have all knowledge, right? I don't think that's true. I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, omniscient. I don't have all knowledge. So where does knowledge come from, right? How is it that I can come to know anything? You know, if I've always had this false beliefs in me, how do I know and separate out what beliefs that I currently have that are false from those beliefs which I think are actually true. So Descartes comes up with this idea, which we're going to call Cartesian skepticism. And essentially what he says is that if it's possible to doubt a proposition being true, that is, it's logically possible to be false, even if all the evidence suggests that it's true, if it's logically possible to be false, then I'm not going to assent to it being true. I'm only going to believe in something if it absolutely has to be that way. All right, now this is really important, right? Because there's going to be, um, how do we do this? How can we come to know anything? Um, so he says, I want to come to know whether my beliefs are true or false. 
So how do I do it? So he says, what well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to doubt everything. I'm just going to assume that what I currently believe was true is actually false. So I'm just going to doubt everything. Uh, now, do I have to doubt every single belief of mine? Well, no, because I would be here forever. and There's no way that we could possibly go through every single belief of mine. But if he says this, he says, it's kind of like a house. So what I'll do is I will question the foundational beliefs that I have. And if I question the foundational beliefs, then any beliefs, if I show that those are false, then any belief which is built upon those false foundational beliefs will also be false, right? And they will all come crashing down. Um, so let's go ahead and think about what is uh, what I think is actually true or how I gain some sort of knowledge. So let's think about the senses for just a moment here. Um, do we actually gain knowledge through our senses or do we need reason to make sense of our senses themselves? So that the senses, or is that what's providing knowledge or is it the reason which interprets that knowledge that is providing knowledge? So um, think about your senses for a bit. If you were to go out and look at the sun, don't look too long, how big is the sun? So you have two... Um, ways of interpreting this going on. One, if you look at your senses, right, and you were to go look at uh, the sun, what does it look like? It looks like the sun is about the size of, you know, a quarter, right? But you also have this rational side of you where you realize that the sun is much, much bigger than the size of a quarter. So what's happening here is you have a sense data, you have uh, information coming through your senses, but they're wrong. It's lying to you. Your senses here are mistaken. And so Descartes says, if my senses deceive me, at least in this situation, where else do they deceive me? And he comes to understand that I, in fact, cannot rely upon my senses because it may, in fact, not be true because my senses deceive me all the time. It would be the same as uh, if you had a friend of yours that lied all the time. And then they come and tell you some new idea. Are you really going to believe them if they have a history of lying? Well, the same can be true of our senses. They have a history of giving us mis mistakes. And so if we're going to try to understand what is knowledge and have some sort of real understanding of knowledge, we have to get rid of the sense data as the beginning of our actual uh, knowledge. Um, all right. So maybe you want to say, well, yeah, but that's, that's pretty far out there. You know, the senses are going to give us some sort of information. All right, well, isn't it possible, Descartes says, that I uh, am dreaming? Right? Have you ever had a dream where it just seems so real? And that the moment that you're dreaming, you can't really tell the difference between what is the actual reality and what is the dream itself. Have you ever had a dream which was so vivid and clear? that it seemed like it actually happened. Well, how do you know that's not happening right now? How do you know that you're not dreaming of listening to a philosophy lecture uh, versus you're actually listening to a philosophy lecture? What is the actual truth and how can you come to know that? Uh, well, some people say, well, I could tell the difference between dreaming or not. Okay, well, what about if you are, um, say, brain damaged madman, right? Isn't it possible that I'm dreaming? How can I know that I, I'm not insane or that I'm not asleep? Isn't it possible that maybe, maybe there's this evil demon out there and this evil demon is making me believe that my senses are actually true and that all of the uh, world that exists around me is actually there. Isn't that possible? So insofar that it's possible, we're not going to accept that our senses are going to give us uh, reliable information because one, uh, the senses deceive us. Two, uh, there's no way for me to know whether I'm dreaming or not and therefore that the, the senses where it appears that uh, it's real, but I might be dreaming, it's all just in my mind. Another problem is, is I don't know if I'm so severely mentally ill that I am maybe uh, having hallucinations, that I'm hearing things or seeing things, uh, which in fact are not there. Um, 
And of course, there's another possibility that there's an evil demon making me believe say things like 2 plus 3 equals 5 when in fact it doesn't, or making me believe that a square has four sides when in fact it doesn't, or making me believe that there's this world out there when in fact there is not. So I can't come to know that. All right, so Descartes spends his first day and his first meditations really beginning to understand what it is he doesn't actually know, and he's going to now, in his second meditations, try to build up from the foundations of this really difficult Cartesian skepticism, this doubt that if it's possible to doubt it, we don't assent to being true. So Descartes kind of wakes up on his second day and he says, you know, um, I don't know what is true and what is false, that I have fallen down into a deep abyss by which I cannot find my way out. How do I know anything? I mean, if there really is an evil demon out there making me believe things that are in fact false, how can I ever know anything at all? Is it possible for me to know anything? And so Descartes needs to consider this idea. And he says, well, what is it that I could possibly know? And he says, let's think about, um, you know, what existence is. What does it mean to exist? And how do I know anything exists? And he goes a little further and says, how do I know that I exist? Is it possible that I actually don't exist? And here, he, he uh, develops an argument that many people are familiar with, where he says this, I know that I'm doubting my existence at this moment. But in order for me to doubt my existence, mustn't I actually be a thing first to doubt my existence? That is, I must exist to doubt my existence. And since I know I'm doubting my existence, I know that insofar that I'm thinking about my existence, I actually must exist first. So insofar that I think, I know that I am. So a lot of people say, well, I think, therefore I am. He doesn't say it in exactly those, that way, but nonetheless, that's essentially what he is saying. Um, and so now notice here, he's now on his second day of meditations, and he comes to know something. He knows something, and this is going to be true, that... I know that I exist because I'm thinking about my existence. You know that that's in fact true um, because it has to be true, right? He knows it so vividly and clear that it's true. Uh, and bring it about saying maybe there's an evil demon out there. Well, let's say that there is an evil demon making me believe things which are false. Wouldn't I actually have to exist in order for the evil demon to make me believe anything? And so no matter what, we can be absolutely certain of one thing. That is, I exist. All right, so now he's gone through an entire day and onto a second day, and all he has is I exist. And now he wants to think of, okay, well, now that we've established that I exist, what am I? What kind of thing am I uh, to actually exist? Well, Descartes says, how do I know that I exist? I know that I exist because I'm thinking about my existence. So how do I know I exist? What kind of thing am I? If I know I exist because I think about my existence, then I'm the type of thing that thinks. Descartes comes to understand now his second point of knowledge. That is, I am a thinking thing. I am a thing that thinks. All right, so Descartes now knows two things. One, that he exists. And two, that he is, in fact, a thinking thing. Well, what does it mean to think? What is it? So he says, I am a thinking thing, but what is it to be a thing that thinks? Well, he says, thinking, of the, you know, if you just introspect into yourself and try to understand what it is that you're able to do, what it is that it is to be your kind of mind. Descartes says, a thing that doubts, understands, affirms, denies, wants, refuses, and also imagines and senses. Now, whether the sense data is actually true or not is irrelevant, but I have the impression that I'm having some sort of sense data, and this seems to be true within my mind. So, um, is the argument that the mind, is it? can I know that the mind exists? Can I come to know the mind more than I know the body? Well, Descartes thinks you can. That He actually argues that the mind is more knowable than the body itself. Right? It's possible that all knowledge of external objects, that includes my body, could be false as the result of the actions of some sort of evil demon. But it is not, however, possible that I could be deceived about my existence or my nature as a thinking thing. Therefore, 
our mind is much more clear, known, much more clearly and distinctly known to us than our body. Understanding comes from inside the mind and doesn't come from the senses at all. So he gives an example of how it is that a knowledge and knowing something is grasped by my mind, but not by the senses. And so in the second meditation, he gives an example of what we're calling the wax argument. And so what he does is he has this piece of wax and he holds it up to the fire. So he says he holds up this piece of wax, for example, and has just been taken from the honeycomb. And if you taste it, it's taste of honey and has the scent of flowers from which the honey was gathered. Its color, shape, and size are very plain to see. It's hard, cold, and can be handled easy. If you tap it with your knuckle, it makes a sound. In short, it has everything that seems to be needed for a body to be known perfectly clearly. But what happens if you take that piece of wax and put it next to the fire? Then it starts to melt. So what was originally a hard piece of wax starts to become a soft piece of wax. Uh, the taste is going to change. The smell is going to change. All of this, what you're getting from the senses from the wax is actually going to change, right? So um, it's going to change shape. It's going to it might change color. It might change taste. It might change how how it feels. Is it hard or is it soft? So the question to you is this: Is it the same piece of wax? Is it the same piece of wax that he had before he put it next to the fire? How do you know? How do you know that that's true? Are you going to say that it, it is true because our senses tell us? Well, our senses are telling us that it's you know this piece of wax is all sorts of you know has different characteristics at different times, and so from our senses we'd have to say well. You know, this wax has this properties at this time, but has different properties at different times. So the senses would suggest to us that, in fact, it's two different pieces. It's two different types of wax. But we know it's the same wax because we grasped the waxness. We grasped the essence of what the wax was with our mind. So our knowledge is not being derived from our sensory data, but rather our knowledge is being derived from our mind. That is, empiricism is false and rationalism is true. All right. All right. So um, that's the first two meditations. Let's go ahead and start with the third meditations. Um, so Descartes is now on his third meditation and he accepts, you know, from the second meditations that he now knows he's a thinking thing. So he knows that this thing, what it means to think is to doubt, affirm, deny, understand a few things. Uh, being ignorant of many things, a type of thing that wills or refuses. And he says that even if uh, he imagines that there's no outside world, sensations and mental images do exist inside of him. Uh, and, but couldn't it just be that these, the sensation that there's an outside world, the feeling that there's an outside world, the qualitative experience uh, that you think that you're sensing the outside world, couldn't that all be false? Can it, can it just be a mind understanding it? Or can it, uh, the mind have these ideas and then just modify its thoughts to experience this? So Descartes thinks that that's a possibility. So um, he says, in the first knowledge, there's nothing but a what he calls a clear and distinct grasp of what he affirms. Um, now, your reading actually says vivid and clear, but in the history of teaching Descartes, everybody has said the phrase clearly and distinctly. But since you're reading from earlymoderntext.com, uh, your reading is actually going to use different words vivid and clear. They're going to mean the same thing and I'm going to go back and forth probably with them. But anytime I say clear and distinct, think vivid and clear. Or anytime I say vivid and clear, think clear and distinct. All right. And so what he establishes is that anytime I know something clearly and distinctly, I can understand that it's true. What's a problem for this? Well, he has accepted as completely obvious and certain many thoughts which were later determined to be dubious. So for example, he had thoughts about the earth, the sky, the stars, and objects of sense. Uh, but the only thing that he knows is that these are sensations or ideas that appear in the mind, right? So it's that I'm having the experience that there's an outside world. That's it. I can't, that in and of itself doesn't prove there's an outside world. 
I just know that it's impressed upon my mind, these sensations, and that is making me believe that. But since I realize I might be wrong about many other things, I can't uh, hold that I'm right about the outside world. Um, before he says that uh, he endeavored on his project of meditations, he just assumed and he just affirmed that the ideas uh, resembled actual things. So that when I have the sensation of, say, if I'm sitting by a fire, I have the sensation of warmth. That is, I thought the warmth came from the fire. It resembled something about the fire. Or when I sense uh, the fire in any other way, that the uh, how I'm actually sensing is how that fire actually is. But can we hold that to be true? Well, what follows from this? Well, if I consider something very simple, uh, such as arithmetic or geometry, so let's say 2 plus 3 equals 5, can I affirm that to be true? See, the only reason that we had for doubting is that there might be some evil demon making me believe it's true. But what I can know is this, he says, whoever may deceive me, be he, he will never bring it about that I am nothing while I think that I am something, or that I have never been when it is now true that I am. Or that 2 plus 3 is either more or less than 5, or that something else in which I recognize an obvious inconsistency is true. So, here's the thing. We know, he says, that, I mean, it's possible that there's an evil demon, and maybe this godlike thing, right, this all-powerful, all-knowing being, isn't that possible that God is a deceiver? And here's his problem. How do we know God exists? Right, so if we're going to try to answer the question that God's trying to deceive us to believe in things that are, uh, aren't actually there but get us to believe them anyways, why would I think God actually exists? What reasons do we have for this? So this leads Descartes to two questions. One, does God exist? And two, is God a deceiver? So to start answering these questions, we first got to categorize our thoughts. Which of the thoughts are actually true or false? So let's think of some thoughts. We have thoughts of, uh, that are images of things. So of a human being. Um, he gives the example of uh, a shimmera, right? We get, we get these ideas or some sort of thoughts as if they're images of things. And these are what he's going to call properly ideas. But other thoughts have properties too. So uh, I recognize some thoughts have other properties. So for example, I can will, firm, uh, excuse me, will, fear, affirm, or deny. Well, these thoughts include a component in addition to the likeness of that thing. And he calls these components volitions or emotions. And he calls others judgments. So it is true that when I imagine, say, a goat, that you actually imagine those things. We needn't worry about the falsehood in volitions or emotions. Uh, he says, if I perversely want something that does not exist, it's still true that I want that thing, right? So my my little daughter loves uh, My Little Pony, right? She loves My Little Pony. They don't actually exist. There is no Pegasus. There are no unicorns. But she still loves those things, right? Um, so we don't need to worry about volitions or emotions. So what is left? Judgments. And here is where we need to be very careful not to make any sort of error. So the first error is that I find in my judgments is that of assuming that the ideas in me have a similarity or conformity to the things outside of me. So how do we come to get ideas? There's three ways. We can either have an idea which is innate. That is, I'm born with this sort of idea, with some sort of knowledge. I can acquire it so that something else gives it to me, whatever that thing is, or I can produce ideas. I can just make stuff up, right? So ideas by which I understand what reality, truth, and thought seem to have come from my own nature. Ideas when I hear a noise or I see the sun or feel fire are ones that I formally judge to come from things outside of me. And then there's other types of ideas, say a gargoyle, a siren, a hippogriff, um, a pegasus, a unicorn. Those we just form inside ourselves, right? We just make that kind of stuff up because you've never actually, say, experienced a unicorn or a pegasus or anything like that, 
right? So we're just making things up when we get there. So it may be the case that all of our ideas are innate, acquired, or created by me, but where do these ideas come from? Okay, so the central question is about the ideas that he views as being derived from objects that exist outside of him. But what reason is there for thinking that these ideas resemble objects? These ideas are independent of my will, and hence me. They appear whether I want them or not. So, for example, if you are sitting next to the fire and feel the heat, um, you're going to feel that heat if you're next to the fire, whether you like it or not, right? So the obvious thing to think is that what a thing sends to me is its own likeness. That is, the fire actually is hot and is producing the feeling of hot inside of me, the sensation of what it is, say, to feel heat. Um, but is that true? Is it true that there's the likeness of the fire has to be hot in order for me to feel heat? So are these good reasons? So when we say that nature teaches me something, we mean just that we have a spontaneous impulse to believe it. Not that the lights of nature reveals the things truth to it, to me. And this is going to be an important difference. So, for example, when the light of nature reveals the things truth to me, such as my thinking implies my own existence, that thing is completely beyond doubt. But as of for natural impulses, I've judged them to lead me astray. And they do not depend on my will. And just because my sensory ideas may not depend on my will, it doesn't follow that they come from outside of me. The natural impulses are inside of me. So it is possible that I have an undiscovered ability to produce in myself ideas that seem to come from outside of me. For example, when I'm dreaming, I have formed such ideas in myself without the aid of any sort of external objects. I can, in fact, create ideas. I can, in fact, create sensations within myself. And so I can't just rely that this is coming from outside of me because I can make all of it up myself. But even if some of my ideas do come from things distinct from me, it doesn't follow that they are the likeness of things. An idea can differ greatly from its cause. So, for example, we have two ideas of the sun. The first one, I take in the information through the senses. What does the sun look like? It looks really, really small, right? It looks really small if you're to look at it. But I have a second understanding of the sun. That is, I derive it from astronomical reasoning. I know the sun is many, many times larger than the Earth. Well, it's not possible for both of these ideas to be true that the sun is the size of a quarter, or that the sun is many more times larger than the Earth. Those can't both be true, right? Which one do you actually believe is true? Do you really believe that the sun is the size of a quarter, or do you believe that the sun is many times larger than the Earth? Well, it suggests to me that I believe in the astronomical reasoning. Well, what do I have to do here? I have to push the sense data aside. Right? He says, in fact, reason convinces me that the one least like the sun is the one that seems to arise most directly from it. So what this shows is that the idea that there are things outside of me impressing their ideas or images in me has rested on some sort of blind impulse rather than on any sort of certain judgment. And that the ideas that show me substances are unquestionably greater or have more what he calls presentational reality. It just seems more, it sort of presents itself, than those that merely show me modifications or accidents. Okay, so let's talk about God for a bit, now that we've established what this all is. Can I come to know that God exists? How do I know God exists? Remember, we still have those two questions. Does God exist and is God a deceiver? Well, let's start off from what seems to be true. I have an idea of a God of some sort of supreme being, a thing which is eternal, infinite, omniscient, omnipotent, the creator of all things other than himself. And this idea has more presentational reality in it than the ideas which present finite substances. That is, reason has revealed that there is at least as much in the complete efficient cause as in the effect. For what can have an effect gets its reality if not from the cause. How can a cause give what it itself doesn't have? 
All right, so think of, um, I don't know, building a brick house, right? There has to be as much reality uh, in the brick as there is in the brick house, right? You can't get the brick house unless you have first the brick. That is the quality of what the brick has to in order to build the brick house. So what follows from this is that something cannot come from nothing. And that what is more perfect, or in other words, has more reality in it cannot come from that which is less perfect and has less reality. So for example, it's impossible for a non-existent stone to come into existence unless it is produced by something containing everything in the stone. Similarly, it is impossible for the idea of heat or of a stone to be in me unless it has been put there by a cause in which there is at least as much reality as in the heat or the stone. So we should think that each idea contains one particular presentation or reality, which it must get from a cause having at least as much formal reality as the idea of the presentational reality. So to believe otherwise is to believe that something has come from nothing, and, and Descartes thinks that's absurd. Um, so although the reality that I am considering in my ideas is just presentational, I ought not to suspect that it needs to be in the ideas, cause formally. It suffices for it to be there presentationally, and I can clearly and distinctly know this is true. All right, it's a, so we have this presentational reality. So what follows from this? Uh, one, if the presentational reality of one of my ideas is so great that I can be confident that the same degree of reality is not in me either formally or eminently, I can conclude that I cannot be the cause of that idea. I didn't cause it. Another thing must necessarily exist as its cause. Something, right? If something's causing me to have this sort of belief, causing me to have this sensation, causing me to have, right, this presentational reality, right? Some, is that something causing it? So if I know that there's some sort of ideas that I have that are not coming from me, they're coming from outside of me, what do I know? I know that I'm not alone in this world. There is something that is creating these ideas within me. All right. Well, I have ideas of all sorts of things, of God, of physical objects, uh, others like angels or animals or other men like me. As to the ideas of men or of animals or of angels, it's easy to see that I could have composed these ideas from those that I have of myself or of physical objects or of God. Right? Um... But as to the ideas of physical objects, it seems that nothing in them is so great that it couldn't have come from me. So I could have made this stuff up by myself. If I examine my ideas of physical objects carefully, such as, say, the piece of wax that we talked about a bit ago, I notice that there's very little in them that I can grasp clearly and distinctly, except for, say, their extension, shape, positions, motion, substance, duration, and number. But thoughts of other things in physical objects, such as light, color, sound, odor, odor, taste, heat and cold, those kind of tactile qualities, are so confused and obscured that I cannot say whether they are true or false. For example, is heat the absence of cold, or is cold the absence of heat? Is heat actually a positive quality or a negative quality? So think about light for just a bit. Um, is darkness the absence of light? Is it actually a thing to say that something is dark? Is light the absence of darkness? Or is light an actual thing? All right. Um, so, all right. So extension, shape, place, motion can't be in me formally since I am just a thinking thing. But those are modes of substance. And as I am a substance, they cannot be in me eminently. But such ideas do not have to be caused by something other than myself. So these ideas, if they represent uh, non-things, and they are in me because of a deficiency or a lack of perfection in me. If they are true, there's no reason why they shouldn't arise from myself, since they represent such a slight reality that I can't even distinguish it from a non-thing. But what about my vivid and clear elements in my ideas of bodies? I could have borrowed some of these from my idea of myself. I could have made up, say, that, uh, namely, I'm some sort of substance or duration or something, some number. So, for example, I think of a stone as a substance. 
That is, that it exists independently of me. I also think I'm some sort of substance. While a stone and myself, of course, are different, I, I think, and a stone does not, we have the classification of substance in common. We're both something. So I conceive of myself as a thing that thinks and isn't extended, and of the stone as a thing that is extended but doesn't think. So the two conceptions differ enormously, but they seem to have the classification of substance in common. So what is left here is to consider whether my idea of God couldn't have just come from me. Could I have just made up my idea of God? So what do I mean by God? What is this God by which I speak of, that I have the idea of? Well, God is going to be defined for Descartes as an infinite substance, independent, supremely intelligent, and supremely powerful. These qualities, he says, couldn't have come from me. He says, because I don't have these qualities. It seems then that there must necessarily be a God, he says. So while I can have the idea of substance in, in me virtue of my being a substance, I cannot have the idea of an infinite substance in me because I'm not infinite myself. Therefore, the infinite substance must have come from outside of me. Right? So I do not have a true idea of infinity since I grasp it merely as the absence of limits. It is clear to me that there is more reality in the infinite than in a finite substance, and hence that my grasp of the infinite, that is God, must somehow be prior to my grasp of the finite, that is me. And so he says, my understanding of God is prior to my understanding of myself. Right? So think about this. Um, where did the idea of God come from? It's not coming from myself because I don't have things like infinite within me. So there, the presentational reality that I'm getting of God, there must be some sort of reality which is similar to the presentational reality that I have external to me. Now, the presentational reality that I have is of something which is infinite, supremely good, supremely powerful, all-knowing, all-perfect, right? Well, did that come from me? It couldn't. It couldn't have come from me because I don't have any of those qualities. And if I am to build something, I have to have those qualities in order to build it. So, this, for example, if I'm to bake a cake, right, I'm going to need things like, you know, sugar and flour and, and you know, uh, these properties in order to make the cake. If I don't have that, I'll never make the cake. Well, similar to for God, I can't make up the presentational reality of God in me. So there must be something outside of me which has, you know, all-knowing characteristics, all-powerful characteristics, perfectly good characteristics. That thing must exist outside of me and somehow place that presentational reality inside of me. See, I couldn't come up with a thing as being perfect because I'm not perfect. I cannot create a perfect thing because I'm not perfect. I don't have the basic building blocks of perfection to build the perfect thing. So there must be something out there which is creating in me the presentational reality of a God. And that thing must exist. And of the properties that I think that it has of being supremely good, supremely powerful, etc., it must have those things. So what I can establish is that God must exist. There must be something that is a perfect, that is uh, perfectly good, perfectly knowing, perfectly powerful, that is actually impressing these ideas on me. And if this is the true, then what do I know? God exists, right? God exists. So, all right, think about that for a while. Um, that's Descartes kind of in a nutshell. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, email me, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Bye.